Let me uh, open a word of uh, prayer for prayer of illumination. Let's pray. Lord, as we receive your message today, we pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, empower the brothers and sisters in that they will be able to uh, live a holy and righteous life. Uh, not only hearing it, but even doing it uh, for your glory and for them, their neighbor's sake. We ask, Lord, also that uh, you guide me today to uh, uh, send the word and ultimately to glorify Christ in this message. We give you thanks and offer this message to you in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, um, uh, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. Um, or if you have your digital Bible, you may quickly look into Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. For those who don't have their Bible, you can also refer to the bulletin. We have it uh, here. Listen now to God's word. <clears throat> For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Good afternoon. So, um, last sermon we talked about... Um, the gospel-driven agenda, if you can still recall. Um, we talked about Romans chapter 1, verse 8 to 15. And we learned that the content of Paul's agenda in his episode to Rome is that the gospel brings joy and encouragement to the church Catholic, drive one another to service to God, and stimulates the church to persevere in working for the expansion of God's kingdom. This is all through the power of the Holy Spirit. And today, we will receive the word from the following verses, which is Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, in what I titled as the theme of Paul's letter. Maybe some of you know that this is the famous passage that Martin Luther, this is the turning point for Martin Luther, right? But I want to start first with this uh, person who is also famous. Karl Marx, who was born 1818 and lived until 1883, once wrote, I quote, Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, and the soul of the soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. In other words, in the face of suffering, illness, persecution, and tragedy, if you tell people about heaven, a place free from all earthly troubles, a place where they will one day go, then they will endure their present circumstances. Tell people of Utopia, a place where one day in the sweet by and by they will go to that wonderful place in the sky. And they will forget about the pain, the hunger that they feel, the cold they feel from lack of adequate clothing, and the absence of justice they have in face of oppression. Marxism, brothers and sisters, is, for its follower, a humanism which seeks to elevate man to the maximum point of his self-realization. So that, in order to reach this goal, it is necessary to eliminate every barrier with which obstructs it, including religion. The utopia that Marxism seeks to develop is earthly, and man-made, a powerless idea hinged in a hypothetical dreamland where he thinks man is so upright that there will be an eschatological annihilation of classes in a qualitatively new society. This is another attempt of man to suppress his knowledge of God, to employ his works based finite solution to his infinite problem. But this is nothing new under the sun, right? For Marx, he thought that the problem of man is man, and the Marx, Marx proposal for this is the solution is man as well. However, for us Christians, we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, 
to establish a heavenly, perfect kingdom someday. And Marxism is ultimately about material things, the temporal things. While Christianity is ultimately about spiritual things eternal. For Paul, he does not apply an imaginary band-aid to the mortal wounds of humanity's fullness. Paul is not interested in providing transient solutions that will please the darkened and sinful hearts of men. But at the heart of his thesis in this episode that we're going to <clears throat> study today, we see that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. It addresses and transforms and restores the elect and the creation. As some of you may know, this passage that we're going to learn today is also one of the critical passages that fueled the Reformation, the awakening of Martin Luther. And with that, let me open a word of prayer uh, before we uh, start. Lord, I pray that this uh, wonderful truth that we're going to receive from Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17 will be uh, something that uh, the Holy Spirit will use to operate for our brothers to be encouraged and for those who are not yet in Christ will be transformed and uh, restored. And with that, uh, I pray that uh, the congregation will worship you and hallow you and ultimately magnify you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, contrary, contrary to Karl Marx, who puts a premium on his humanistic or materialistic philosophy, no? Luther's problem addresses man's psychosomatic standing before God. When we say psychosomatic, the wholeness of man, right? The material and the immaterial, right? The physical and the spirit. So, Luther's problem addresses man's psychosomatic standing before God, the creator of the cosmos, the author of life. If God is holy and man is sinful, what is there for man? That is his question. This is the problem that Martin Luther wrestled for years and drove him to despair. It caused to cry out at one time, Love God, sometimes I hate Him. Luther is cognizant, he knows, that a finite man cannot provide the solution for his misery. A finite man has no power to change his fellow man, fellow man's overarching problem. That is, slavery of his nature to sin. The incompatibility of man's sin and God, God's holiness. Luther knows that. Therefore, he's standing before God, the great God of creation. He knows that tension. No? Now, when the great reformer made the discovery of Romans 1.17, he speaks about God's gracious verdict of righteousness pronounced upon the believer. He experienced the happiest day of his life. It was as if he had been delivered from a dark dungeon and brought into the beautiful daylight where he could inhale fresh, invigorating, and exhilarating air. And today, I hope and pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we may have the same experience still and love more and more Christ through the preaching of this passage again. Because these are the things that we never graduate. No? The gospel is never, I always say this, it's never relevant after conversion. It always, it is always relevant. So I have given you two points. Number one, the honorable and unmatched saving power of God in the gospel. And the second point is the revealed righteousness from God is obtained by faith. Paul began his thesis by saying, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the Greek word for ashamed here is epeskunamai, or meaning to be ashamed of something. This Greek helps us to understand the, the translation that the King James Version did. No? The rendition that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel about someone. We can agree with King James because in ESV, it says there that I am not ashamed of the gospel. But in KJV, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We can agree with the King James translation that the gospel that he mentioned here is the gospel of Christ, the good news of, of, uh, of what Christ did. And it says, Therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Of course, it's pretty obvious no? that the succeeding words and statement, regardless of the translation, talks about the gospel of Christ. Either use ESV, NIV, uh, NASB. No? But the reason I want to highlight this King James, no? 
rendition and understanding because it is straightforward and clearly connects the gospel to the works of the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. This gives us clear understanding of the impetus or the drive of Paul as to why he was putting everything on the line when he said, I'm not ashamed. Because clearly, it's about Christ. The person who saved and transformed him and multitudes of people, including you and me. You see, if the gospel is about Christ, and Christ is the second person of the Trinity, this means, in other words, Paul can also mean that I am not ashamed of God. I'm not ashamed of God. Now, I want to emphasize that, that word shame because it's a big deal in the ancient Near East. Maybe for us, when we say shame, oh, that's shame. We don't do that again. Right? But for them, it's different. Shame is a big thing in the ancient Near East culture. It can cost you your dear life. This is crucial to our understanding of this passage because some commentators say that the, the word shame concerns the nature of the gospel itself. After all, to the outsider, the gospel sounds like nothing more than the death of a Jewish carpenter who himself was part of a small, somewhat insignificant nation under Roman dominion. The wise of this world would say that this is foolishness. We can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. And at times, they, it is also a stumbling block to them. Shame is one of the first emotions mentioned in the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, pre-fall Adam and Eve never felt and know it even though they were naked. But after the fall, shame becomes constant and unavoidable. It is experienced, it experienced hundreds of times by major and minor biblical character and sometimes collectively by the entire people. God meets it out as punishment to the worst sinner. It is a fate almost as bad as death. As if the fruit of Adam's sin were not bad enough, our shame only gets worse. Our own transgression pile up, making our dishonor, dishonor grow day by day. We can read that in Romans 3.23. We can say, in view of the Eden incident, that the highest form of shame in the Bible is when man honored the call of, uh, call of Satan rather than God. That's the highest degree of shame. Why? Because heeding the call to worship of the created rather than the creator. Man dishonored the father and received death. And we can read that in Genesis 3.19 when the pronouncement of curse of the covenant of works was uttered. You can read, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, in the Sinaitic Covenant, or the Mosaic Covenant, this has been recapitulated to Israel in the context of the covenant household. No? Yung perspective of honor and shame. Let's quickly read it so that we would be reminded of that shame that is being dealt with in the covenant community in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 27, 16, it says there, Cursed be anyone who dishonor his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. While in Exodus 21 verse 17, it says there, Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now, children nowadays, when you talk about shame, it's, it's no big deal. In the Old, in the old Testament, you bring, honor, you bring shame to your father or mother, you, you die. Because there is a spiritual significance. And later we'll, we'll talk about it. And what's the relevance of this shame thing to Paul? What he's saying right now. Huh? You know, in our time, damning sinful act that will put your parents to shame is tantamount to death in the OT. But children nowadays, if they are sutil, especially some, some toddlers, parents call it cute. Right? If they did something, uh, if they uh, spout bad words from their mouth, that is so manly and cute. Right? If they slander their parents in, in public, some, some parents would say, that's my son. Right? They're glorifying evil. If they are teens or part of the LGBT community, the rebellious LGBT community, some parents would even go far beyond and saying, brave, that this child is brave. Right? The worst is that they are really proud of it. You don't have to be ashamed. Simply, the world tells us the opposite. Sin is honorable, and God's holiness is shameful. Right? 
in failure of mankind giving honor to their parents and to God, God by His loving kindness and faithfulness to His covenant comes the great reverse. He did a great reversal of these things. No? Christ as our champion, our eldest brother, reversed the shameful act of Adam. How? He honored the Father in heaven by giving His own life in obedience and love to the will of the Father. And we can see that this is the fulfillment of the fifth commandment. The first commandment with a promise. Right? It says there, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Right? This is the ten commandment. The perspective there is that this has been given to the household of faith, the covenant community. Honoring your parents in the Israel perspective is honoring the God of your fathers. If you don't honor the God of your fathers, you will be disciplined and will be exiled somewhere. Right? However, Christ honored His earthly parents but by ultimately doing the will of the Father. And by honoring the Father, He was able to secure an eternal place for us so that we may dwell the for- there forever. So parang yun yung fulfillment ng promise ng mga um, fifth commandment, right? This is the striking opposition or antithesis between Adam and Christ. We can see that sin brings shame and death, but Christ brings honor and life. Therefore, for Paul, knowing and believing in what Christ did for us, he is ready to put everything at stake for the gospel. He knows that there is no uh, losing in Christ. We all know before conversion, Paul lived a shameful, a shameful and murderous life. Distant and enmity to God and His church. But by God's grace, we can read that Paul established for, for the Galatians that he received the gospel by the same means as the other apostles, directly from Jesus. And the Spirit used that means to convert Paul. Paul's absence of shame sa gospel is the proof of faith. So, think about it. If you're uh, ashamed of the gospel, you don't mention it to your neighbor, maybe you don't have faith. You're not saved. In our text, there, there is a continuous and progressive unfolding reason no? why Paul is ready to preach the gospel. He tells us why he is not ashamed. In the following words, we read, because it's the power of God unto salvation. That's why he's not ashamed. In verse 17, he said, the righteousness of God is revealed. God saves through the message of the gospel we can read. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, he said, for since, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through the, its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So the implication, implication is that God's power, as it is, is operative unto salvation and through the gospel alone. The gospel is not about personal testimony. When Paul preached the gospel, he's not going to tell you, you know, this is my life before. But don't get me wrong, sometimes he says that. But at the same time, he will always preach who Christ is and what Christ did for us. We don't need to add any sinner's prayer or make a grand altar call to make the gospel powerful because adding something to it means you're ashamed. The gospel message is God's word and the word of God is living and powerful. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Now, it is interesting to note here that the Greek word for power used in this verse was dunamis. Power. Surprisingly, from which they get the word dynamite. Dynamite. The power of the gospel is literally unstoppable dynamite. Right? It destroys walls. It contains a divine power to demolish strongholds. We can read that 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. The gospel breached the wall of sin as it is written in Isaiah 59 2. There is a big wall, no? It says there, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear. Now, when the gospel is preached, the divine word of God echoes shockwave. 
and powerfully destroys the shackle of sin and the elect. Beloved, the very power who said, let there be light, and the God who blew the breath of life in our nostrils is the very God who talks in the gospel, who transforms you. This should give us goosebumps whenever you hear the gospel. Yes, it is ordinarily, be, ordinarily being preached in the pulpit. But the work of the Holy Spirit is not ordinary. It is special for the elect. That whenever you hear the gospel preached to you, the unmatched, omnipotent, saving power of God, it is God being displayed to you. When Pastor Kim preached the gospel earlier, you're basically seeing God's power being displayed right there. No, no, no uh, grand entrance of uh, any pastor or no grand superpower, magic, anything. Because you cannot dictate how God will operate. He will dictate it through the means of grace. As it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For God who said, Let the shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Beloved, these are the things that we never graduate. I always tell this. Together with Paul, we should never be ashamed of the gospel. As I mentioned in my previous sermon, the gospel is not only relevant to pre-conversion, but even after conversion, because the gospel becomes sweeter and sweeter, for in it we see the power of God. Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 11 says there, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but the water, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. But sit, but sit shall come accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That is the power of the Lord in the gospel. His word is power. In the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, how is the word made effectual to salvation? And the answer is, the Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up on, in holiness. See, it's not just pre-conversion. And building them up in holiness and com comfort through faith unto salvation. You see, brothers and sisters, the Spirit powerfully uses the preaching of the gospel to enable us to persevere in our journey to the celestial city. Simultaneously, the Spirit uses it to restore us in the image of Christ, restoratively speaking. So the gospel saves powerfully. We can now see here that the power of uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But also this power of God that we're talking about right now, is uh, there is two perspectives of this. Negatively and positively. No, merong, pa merong positive and negative aspect of power. Panginoon. When we talk about negatively, the power of God unto salvation, it means it rescues men from number one, guilt. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Number two, negatively, it, is, it, res it rescues men from pollution of sin. Right? Romans 6, 6, chapter 6, verse 6. Negatively, in the sense that it rescues men from slavery, from sin. And lastly, it rescues men from the punishment. That's the negative aspect of that power. The positive aspect, it brings men into state of righteousness. Number one. Number two, it brings men in a state of holiness. See, it's so complete. Right? A third, it gives us freedom to worship God freely. Fourth, it gives us blessedness. Fellowship with God, the love of God, the new and everlasting life. This manifestation of God's power was displayed both to the Jews first, in the Old Testament, and to the Gentiles, of course, later on. 
to see, brothers and sisters, God's mercy is wide and great. And He has dispensed it universally through the preaching of the gospel, the message gone through every tribe, tongue, and nation. And this negative aspect is positive. It was given to everyone without any partiality for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the power of God. Not because you're rich, not because you are so smart, but because you need the gospel because uh, you are dead in sin. The sun used to set on the borders of the gospel as only Israel possessed them. And the surrounding pagan nations did not. But ever since the Pentecost, if you remember Pastor Kim's preaching, uh, preaching before, but ever since Pentecost and the reversal of the curse of, of Babel, no, the nations are no longer divided according to race and language, but are now united in Christ through the gospel. Now Paul leads us to verse 17 as to why he said that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And this leads us to our second point. The revealed righteousness of God is obtained by faith. We call some, some people call it the alien righteousness. Paul said, for in, it, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. This leads us to question, what is the righteousness of God? And who is the righteousness of God? And how do we obtain it? Right? First we ask, what is the righteousness of God? And the answer is, God Himself. God's character is righteous and is the definition of what is righteousness is. No? We don't declare what is right and what is wrong. God's very character is the standard of what is right. God is holy and just. Now, we all know, for those uh, uh, studious Bible reader, that the theme of this episode is justification in view of union with Christ. And in these two verses, the Apostle is giving us an introductory summary of his leading thesis. This moves us to know what righteousness of God is something that we don't have and we can't do. Because if the righteousness of God, or if, the, if what is righteousness of God, and we talk about here that it says here, it's God, His character, of course you don't have that. Right? So this moves us to know the righteousness of God is something that we don't have and we can't do. Because after the fall of man, all that we do was and is stained by sin. As it is written in Isaiah 59 verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, says there, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Then if God is holy and I am not, who is my righteousness? The righteousness of God is therefore the righteousness of God that is unto our justification. The righteousness which he calls later on the free gift of righteousness came from one man. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. I think you know where I'm going right now. The one righteousness, you can read that in 5.18. The obedience of the one, Romans 5.19. And his name is Christ Jesus. For if because of one man trespass, death reigned through, the, through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. The gospel reveals the righteousness that God gives to His people. The perfect obedience of Christ. This is righteousness. Paul says this comes by faith alone, which he emphasized by the phrase, from faith to faith. This is what Luther called justicia alienum in Latin. I'm not a Latin expert, so pardon for the way how I say it. It sounds like a uh, true Filipino when I you know, say this. Justicia alienum. An alien righteousness. A righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. 
It's a righteousness that is extra nos outside of us. Praise God for that. Because if it's my righteousness, it's filthy rags, right? It's an extra nos outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. Now, to give a little background of Luther, no? when Luther wrestled with this passage, the Latin word for justification that was used at this time in church history was, and it's the word from which we get the English word justification. The Latin word is justificare. Or, naman, justificare. Because you don't say J, justificare. That's, that's RK. H -E. No, just kidding. And it came from the Roman judicial system. And the term justificare is made up of the word justus, which is justice or righteousness, and the verb, the infinitive pakare, which means to make. And so the Latin fathers understood doctrine of justification is what happens when God, through the sacraments of the church and elsewhere, the seven sacraments, the relics, etc., the indulgence and all, make someone, uh, make unrighteous people righteous. That's how they understood it before. But Luther was looking now at the Greek word that was in the New Testament, not the Latin word. The word is dikaios. Did I pronounce it correctly? Dikaios. Or dikaiosune. Dikaiosune. Yeah. Which didn't mean to make righteous, but rather to regard as righteous, to count as righteous, to declare as righteous declaration. And this was the moment of awakening for Luther. He said, you mean here Paul is not talking about righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God gives freely by grace, by his grace, to people who don't have righteousness of their own? It is what he called justicia alienum, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. It's a righteousness that is extra nos outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. And when Luther discovered this, that he said, when I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. The gospel is the good news of life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a victory news. According to the scripture alone, from Genesis to Revelation, the gospel is God's promise of a son who will crush the serpent's head, forgive his people, raise them from the dead, restore them to be an image bearer of Christ, give them everlasting life, and to have everlasting fellowship with God and his people, by grace alone, for the sake of Christ. And this is the power of God for salvation. Unto salvation. That's so beautiful. Now that we know that this is righteous, that, that this righteousness is outside of us, how can how can a man obtain this salvation, this righteousness? No? That begs the question. How? Okay. okay, that's righteousness. So how? In this passage, Paul quoted the prophet Habakkuk. In Habakkuk 2:4, it says there, "Behold, his soul is puffed up; it is not upright within him, but the righteousness shall live." But the righteous shall live by his faith. What has this Old Testament verse has to do with this thesis of Paul? Bakit niya sinabi yan? And you all know, during the time of Paul, ang scripture niya, Old Testament. Okay. A quick context before we go there. Habakkuk poured out his despair to the Lord in this passage. He was greatly concerned for the spiritual state of Israel. He looked on the land and did not see righteousness holiness or godliness. But what he saw was the contrary. So Habakkuk knows that if they, if they disobey, they would suffer the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. You can, you can read that in Deuteronomy 28. No? So he cried out to the Lord. He pleaded to intervene. No? Sabi niya sa Habakkuk verse 1 to 2, Habakkuk's complaint, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Oh, cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Yeah, imagine this conversation. Huh? But he was surprised as the Lord responded in a different way. 
The Lord told Habakkuk that He would raise up the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, a pagan Gentile people, to attack Israel and carry them into captivity. It's like this, no? I pray to the Lord. Pilgrim is full of wicked people, Lord. Please transform and change their thing. And then what the Lord told me is, don't worry, I will send the ISIS to kill them all. <laughs> My goodness. Right? So if you're in His shoes, right? I will uh, send uh, all the I- uh, ISIS to obliterate pagan community church. Okay. The Lord allows Babylonians to invade and destroy and carry Judah away into captivity. This pagan will not only sweep, remember this, uh, this pagan nation will not only sweep the covenant breakers, but even the righteous. Walang pipili into mga to. Despite the impropriety of Habakkuk's complaint, God nevertheless mercifully replied to him saying, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. God's answer is simple yet profound. God is not blind to the condition of his people, nor has he forgotten his covenant promise. The Lord's reply to Habakkuk echoes the Abrahamic covenant. How? The great patriarchs who looked to his own life with utter despair because he had no male heir. Remember that, right? God entered into a covenant with him and promised him many offsprings. Sarah and Abraham were old and were as good as dead. Well, beyond childbearing age na sila, no? Menopausal sa panahon natin. But Abraham took God at his word. As it is written, he's, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham did not receive this status by his own works, but by faith and trust in Yahweh. This was God's message to Habakkuk, to continue to trust in me, even in the face of circumstances that might lead you to believe that I have forgotten you. That's so difficult, no? Imagine, no? Sige, Lord, padala mo ISIS, I still believe in you. Okay? But God have not and will not forget His promises to His covenant people. This message lies at the center of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And it's the reason why he quoted Habakkuk. For us to obtain the righteousness of God in Christ like Abraham, we are to put our faith to our Savior Christ Jesus. Because we cannot... You know, before you put your faith to the Lord, you have to understand the complexity of God's character. Mamamatay ka na. If you're trying to figure out His complexity, you can do that. Right? But let's uh, let's try to ask Paul, no? how can we obtain this? Because Paul gave us no, his word, how he was able to obtain this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, it says here, Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For for His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Sabi ni Paul yan. Justifying faith is a saving grace wrought in the heart of sinners by the Spirit and the Word of God, whereby He, being convinced of His sin and misery and of the disability in Himself and all other creatures to recover Him out of His lost condition, not only assented to the truth of the promise of the Gospel, but received it and rested upon Christ and His righteousness therein held forth for pardon of sin, and for the accepting and accounting of his person right, righteous in the sight of God's for salvation. This is the Westminster. West no? God is com- a complete provider. He's a complete provider. No? He is the perfect provider. You see, even the saving faith that Paul is talking about here, that's God's gift. Because it says in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, let's return to verse 17 quickly. The term in question in Romans 3.17, some commentators said that it should be rendered as righteousness 
from God instead of God. No? Because the author is God, so the one who imputes the right standing to the sinner is God, who accepts it by faith. No? Also, some interpretation of the expression dun sa verse 17, the ESV, from faith to faith, it was better rendered in the translation in NIV. No? So NIV, it says there, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, and a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. This rendering simply, I think I, 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 I kind of more on to this rendering ng NIV. This rendering simply solidifies that from start to finish, the righteousness is sola fide. No? And from start to finish, He will never leave us or forsake us. Brothers and sisters, this is the beauty of the gospel. This wonderful, comforting truth that Paul is introducing to us is not something new. The word, as it as it is written, Sabidon, as it is written, show that he is basing his inter, uh, his presentation in the Old Testament, which means the same faithful God who made a covenant with Abraham is the same God who brings forth good tidings to us in the gospel. The righteousness and salvation is repeatedly presented as a treasure that belongs to Jehovah. And He will pour this lavishly to His beloved people. Lavishly to the people of God, to the covenant community. Now, dear beloved, as an application, there are several things that we can learn from here. Number one, let us honor God by not being ashamed of the gospel. By sharing the truthfulness of the gospel as it is. In that, we don't water down it to make it acceptable or palatable to those who are perishing. But you know, my office mate, uh, I didn't you know, I, I, when we talk about the Lord, I didn't even know that it open the gospel. This is, we don't water it down to make it acceptable or palatable to those who are perishing. Simply because this is the power of God unto salvation. Don't bend it to make it acceptable culturally or even add anything to it to make it appealing to those who are conceited and proud. For the Bible said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Also, your personal life, health, wealth, relationship, testimony is not the gospel. It is just simply the effect of the, or the result of God's sovereign goodness. Preach the cause, the gospel, and not the effect, your life testimony. The gospel fulfills people, but at the same time, humbles people, so preach it as it is, just like Paul. Number two, let us live a holy life, dedicating it to God. A gospel-shaped life, the gospel does so much more than Rescue us from hell and save us from heaven. Sorry. Rescue us from hell and save us so that we may attain the celestial city with the Lord. It is also it also takes possession of our lives and remakes them into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. This is God's ultimate purpose. For every one of his blood bought and dearly loved children, you are now living for God in service. Uh, service to God and for God and his, and his people, you don't live a selfish life. No? Surely, our life is not the gospel but living a life opposite to the good news that you receive and believe. As if the power of the Holy Spirit did not change you, then you're simply shaming the gospel. We're talking about the gospel but your way of life is uh, contrary. You're shaming the gospel as well. Like, uh, my life is not about the gospel, so don't look at me. Sure. But the Holy Spirit works ordinarily in the gospel to transform you and restore you as well. Right? So as an application, don't shame the gospel by living a wicked life. Okay? For without holiness, no one will see God. And without holiness, therefore, sanctification, restoration, this means you did not receive salvation at all if you don't have holiness. Our union with Christ gives us with perseverance until the last. So, press forward pilgrims, walk with holiness, peace, and joy, knowing that Christ is in us and for us from start to finish. Now, lastly, 
For those of you who doesn't know Christ or who don't know Christ or doesn't know the gospel or not a believer and lover of Christ, those who's clawing their way up to God, trying their sinful effort to please God, if this is the first time you heard of the word alien righteousness or have heard the gospel of Jesus, let me tell you this. I can think of no more terrifying moments than to stand before a holy God. Stained with guilt and sin, knowing that I am worthy of condemnation. But you know what? But I can think of no greater blessing than to know that because of what Christ has done for me, I stand righteous in God's sight and no longer know of the lost condemnation or God's wrath against my sin. I no longer know God as judge but only as a loving father and Christ as my loving brother who laid down his life for me. The prodigal son who refused to come home. Now, this same truth holds true for anyone who believes in Christ. We are no longer rebels, but sons of the living God. And with that, together with Paul, let us not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're always at awe. We're always excited and joyful to hear the message, the good news, the gospel of what Christ did for us. And with that, Lord, we, we always forget these things at times, especially if we are in trouble, if we are in danger, we tend to lean on ourselves rather than to you. But Lord, be merciful and allow the Holy Spirit to remind us of what Christ did for us and what He's going to do for us when He returns so that we may find joy and completion only in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that this word will not go empty but transform the lives of my brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.